stabilization of crisis. This is part two of the concepts in mental health nursing. When patients are not able to deal with their everyday stresses, many of them enter into crisis mode. This can be very difficult for not only the patient, but also, also staff and family members. This is um, crisis intervention from Barcarolas. Um, stress is individual. What is threatening for one person may not be seen as stressful for another person. What is the patient's perception of a threat? As this thing is coming toward them, they're saying they can deal with this or that this is the end of the world. And then there's anxiety. When it works, um, it stabilizes the situation. When it doesn't work, the anxiety increases and the crisis occurs. Um, coping mechanisms are ineffective and these people are then seen at the crisis center. So types of crisis, we have maturational. This occurs across the life cycle. Depends on your life stage um, and it's, it's predictable. An example is midlife crisis, leaving home, marriage, birth of a child, or school. Each de developmental stage represents a maturational crisis vulnerability and heightened potential or a turning point when a person arrives at a new stage um, formerly used coping styles no longer work and new coping mechanisms have yet to be developed the way the crisis um, are resolved at one stage affects the ability to pass through subsequent stages because each crisis provides the starting point for movement towards the next stage if a person lacks support systems and adequate role models Successful resolution may be difficult or may not occur at all. A situational crisis arises from events that are extraordinary, external rather than internal. Something outside of the person causes the crisis. They're often unanticipated, like the loss of a job, death of a loved one, divorce, severe physical or mental illness. Whether or not these events precipitate a crisis depends upon the degree of support, general emotional and physical status, and the ability to understand and cope with the meaning of, meaning of the stressful event. The stressful event involves loss or change that threatens a person's self-concept and self-esteem. And then there's adventitious crisis. It's not part of everyday life. It results from events that are unplanned and may be accidental, caused by nature, or human-made. An example is a natural disaster like a flood or a fire, a national disaster like war or 9-11, or a crime of violence like rape or assault. So you have to decide what crisis your patient is in. There are also phases of a crisis that you have to be aware of. Phase one is when a person is confronted with a conflict or problem that threatens the self-concept, increases feelings of anxiety, and stimulates the use of problem-solving techniques and defense mechanisms. An example is you lost your job, what would you do? Would you go out and drink? Or would you go out and look for a new job? Or would you go talk to your spouse? Then phase two, if the usual defensive response fails and the threat persists, anxiety continues to rise. It produces feelings of extreme discomfort and functioning becomes disorganized. Trial and error attempts at solving the problem to restore balance are done. And then phase three, if trial and error fail, the anxiety escalates, severe panic levels, and person um, mobilizes automatic relief behaviors, withdrawal and flight. And then phase four, if not resolved um, and new coping skills are ineffective, anxiety overwhelms the person. Serious personality disorganization starts. Depression, confusion, violence against others, and possibly suicidal behaviors can be seen, and often these people are seen at this point for help. People should be encouraged to get help early on. We should always be talking to people and asking, if this occurs again, who can you call? What resources do you have available to you? What coping mechanisms will you use? And your job is to teach, teach, teach. So some basics of crisis intervention. Short duration usually just as usually just days or weeks. Um, if greater than that, it would be a chronic. The goal is to get them to pre-crisis level of functioning. They may not be optimal, but it's baseline for the patient. 
Coping skills and other techniques can be evaluated and taught when the patient is at baseline. They cannot be done during a crisis. They may be open to outside intervention, like suggestions, listening, thinking, or trying new things, and this is a good thing. They are in dis e disequilibrium state, um, then they should focus, um, their focus should be on immediate crisis only. What happened? When did it happen? And what is happening now? Communication should be direct. What's happening? Who is with you? Are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are there guns in the house? Are, th are you thinking about hurting someone else? And what do you need? And sometimes we're unable to think when we're in a crisis. We need to think for them because they aren't able to do that. Identify what they need for social support and coping mechanisms. They often have a difficult time identifying social support due to the disequilibrium. Poor support can make the situation worse. Some biological basics and medications. Mental disturbances are often associated with alterations in other brain functions, and the drugs used to treat mental disturbances can interfere with other brain activities. The brain monitors external world. It receives gross messages via the peripheral nerves and must interpret um, them to take the appropriate action. Schizophrenia often experience a sensation that does not originate in the external world. An example is seeing or hearing people that are not there. It regulates the autonomic ner nervous system. The skeletal muscles contraction initiates the cells to contract and also direct fine motor control. Psychiatric disease and treatment with psychotropic drugs um, cause movement disturbances like dystonia. And important to remember that the skeletal muscles controlled by the brain include the diaphragm, which is essential for breathing, and the muscles of the throat, tongue, and mouth, which are essential for speech. Therefore, drugs that affect brain function can stimulate or depress respiration or lead to slurred speech. The brain also regulates the sleep cycle. Unfortunately, many of the drugs used to treat psychiatric problems interfere with the normal regulation of sleep and alertness. The connection between all these functions of the brain are the results of the actions of the individual neurons and the transmission of information. So let's dig into that a little bit deeper. The brain is composed of hundreds of billions of neurons. Functions of the brain result from the actions of individual neurons and the interconnections between them. Electrical impulses go from one end of the cell to another. This electrical impulse consists of a chain in membrane permeability that first allows the inward flow of sodium ions and then the outward flow of potassium ions. Once an electrical impulse reaches the end of a neuron, a neurotransmitter is released. So let's talk about how depolarization and repolarization works. Depolarization is a change in membrane permeability. Sodium moves in and a few potassium cells move out of the cell. Um, sorry, potassium substances. The cell membrane becomes positive on the inside and negative on the outside. The cell then depolarizes. Repolarization is when the cell achieves homeostasis by the movement of potassium out of the cell. Once depolarization occurs, the next cell is then propagated until the message is sent. The propagation of the electrical impulses from one neuron to another serves as a mean of communication between one part of the body and another. Once the electrical impulse reaches the end of the neuron, a neurotransmitter is released. Neurotransmitter is a chemical that functions as a neural messenger. Depending on the neurotransmitter and receptor, the next neuron will either be more or less likely to initiate an electrical impulse. Neurotransmitters are released from the axon terminal at the presynaptic neuron on excitation. This neurotransmitter then diffuses across a space or synapse to an adjacent postsynaptic neuron where it attaches to receptors on the neuron surface. It is this interaction from one neuron to another by way of a neurotransmitter and receptor that allows the activity of one neuron to influence the activity of other neurons. Neurotransmitters are destroyed by immediate inactivation at the postsynaptic membrane, or it is reuptaken by the presynaptic cell and either recycled 
foreign activated. Neurotransmitters are ultimately involved with our emotions. Essentially, neurotransmitters do three things. They excite or pass the message on. They inhibit or stop the message. Or they reuptake or take back um, it into the original cell. And it's either reused or destroyed by intracellular enzymes. Um, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin are destroyed by an enzyme within the cell called monoamine oxidase, or MAO. And acetylcholine is destroyed by an enzyme within the synapse, acetylcholinesterase. Either we have too much or we have too little. Deficiency or excessive neurotransmitters can lead to mental health problems, especially in the limbic system, which links the frontal cortex, basal ganglia, and upper brainstem. The neurotransmitters that have been most consistently linked to mental activity are norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, GABA, and glutamate. A mental health illness is either deficient in certain neurotransmitters, where there's not enough neurotransmitters produced or released, or there's not enough receptors to accept the, the neurotransmitters, or has an excess of certain neurotransmitters. There's too many neurotransmitters that are being released with um, the correct number of receptors, or there's excessive responsiveness of the receptors. So see the document in Blackboard that gives more detail on types of neurotransmitters, and please, please watch the videos that are on there because they can do a much better job than I can at explaining this to you. Structural imaging is one way that we look at brains. These diagnostic studies are looking at the overall structure of the organ and any large damage or changed areas. They're not microscopically looking at the different individual cells, neurons, or receptors. Patients who have had implanted or metal shrapnel need to be very careful with MRIs because of the magnet ability. Functioning imaging shows some activity within the brain. A radioactive tag is used to trace compounds such as glucose. PET scan shows oxygen utilization, glucose metabolism, blood flow, and neurotransmitter to receptor interaction. And a SPET scan shows circulation of cerebrospinal fluid and other simula similar functions as the PET scan. These are PET scans. Look at which parts of the brain are lit up. This shows activity. With schizophrenia, the upper left image reveals lower brain activity in the frontal lobe of a twin diagnosed with schizophrenia. The area affected is in the frontal cortex, which is associated with reasoning skills. This is typically greatly impaired in schizophrenia patients. The limbic system is within the cerebrum. It's a group of structures that includes parts of the frontal cortex, the basal ganglia, and the brainstem. Major area of emotional status and psychological functioning. It's also a major use of norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine as their neurotransmitters. Dysfunction in these areas often shows some type of psychological disease. Think about the lobes of the brain while you're doing your reading. OCD is the lower image. The brain metabolism of glucose is increased in certain areas of the frontal cortex. The brain is very active. People with OCD have a lot of anxiety. And then depression is the upper right image. The patient with depression shows reduced brain activity compared with the control. And temporal lobe changes. GABA types, gamma amino butyric acid. So GABA A receptors exert a sedative hypnotic action on brain function. They are coupled to calcium and or potassium channels are associated with pain, memory, mood, and other CNS functions. They are not defined. GABA A is a calming neurotransmitter in the CNS. Increases in GABA equals decrease in anxiety and increase in sedation and muscle relaxation. Increased effectiveness of GABA that impedes sending alertfulness signals to other nerve cells. And the various subtypes of GABA-A receptors are the targets of benzodiazepines, barbiturates, and alcohol. Benzodiazepines 
have side effects of dizziness, lightheadedness, drowsiness, and change in personality. Benzodiazepine binds to receptor which promotes the activity of GABA by binding to the GABA-A receptor. This binding opens more, more chloride channels, causing hyperpolarization, which inhibits cellular excitation. Chloride is a negative ion on the outside of the cell. Once the chloride channels are open, the inside of the cell becomes more negative, thus making it more difficult for an action potential to occur. In older adults, the use of benzodiazepines may contribute to falls and broken bones. Ataxia is a common side effect secondary to the abundance of GABA receptors in the cerebellum. Decreased cellular excitation equals calming effect. And it helps with anticonvulsants and with alcohol withdrawal. And types of benzodiazepines are diazepam or Valium, clonazepam or clonopin, and alprazolam or Xanax. Barbiturates are very addictive and are not prescribed much. Side effects include over sedation, respiratory arrest, withdrawal, slurred speech, and drowsiness. Patient education is of utmost importance. Be careful with activities that require concentration, like driving, things like that when they're using these medications. When used alone, even at high doses, um, these drugs rarely inhibit the brain to the degree, degree that respiratory depression, coma, and death result. However, when combined with other CNS depressants like alcohol, opiates, or tricyclic antidepressants, the inhibitory actions of benzodiazepines can lead to life-threatening CNS depression. Antidepressants. Norepinephrine and serotonin play a major role in regulating mood. Deficiency in one or both of these mon monoamines within the limbic system equals depression. There are three hypotheses to this. The first is there is a decrease in one or more of serotonin, norepinephrine, or dopamine, and the goal is to increase these neurotransmitters and that will alleviate the depression. The second hypothesis is there are increased receptors caused by low levels of neurotransmitters. Increased receptors equals desensitization of receptors, which causes a delay in the ability to work may be the cause of why it takes so long for the antidepressants to work. And the third hypothesis is there is an increase in production of neurotropic factors um, caused by prolonged use of antidepressants. This regulates the survival of neurons and enhances the sprouting of axons to form new synaptic connections. Tricyclic antidepressants. They are no longer first-line medications since they have more side effects. They take longer to reach an optimal dose, and they're far more lethal in overdose. Tricyclic antidepressant overdose can be fatal, secondary to cardiac conduction disturbances from excessive sodium channel blockade. Blockade, I'm sorry. And then MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Inhibit, inhibition of monoamine oxidase, which is an enzyme that destroys monoamines, increase the synaptic level of neurotransmitters and makes possible the antidepressant effect of these drugs. Monoamine oxidase is found in norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, and many different food substances and drugs. Caution is MAOs um, is needed in the liver to break down monoamine substances that enter via food and drugs. This causes an increase in monoamine tyramine. Monoamine tyramine can cause hypertensive emergencies as they cause vasoconstriction. Foods with tyramine are aged cheeses, and pickled or smoked fish, and wine. They're contraindicated with concurrent use of any other antidepressants and sympathetomimetic drugs. Sorry about that. Normally, tyramine is destroyed by MAO. Tricyclic and SSRIs block the reuptake. MAOIs block the destruction. Other antidepressants include bupropion, or Welbutrin is the other name. It's an antidepressant that is also used for smoking cessation. Um, that's called Zyban. It seems to act as a norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor and also inhibits nicotine acetylcholine receptors to reduce the addictive action of nicotine. 
There's also Vilazidone. Vibrate is the other name. It's a newer antidepressant approved by the FDA in um, January of 2011. The mechanism of action induces enhancing the release of serotonin by inhibiting the serotonin transporter, and this is similar to SSRIs, and by stimulating serotonin receptors via partial, partial agonism. This is similar to the anxiolytic medication Boosperone. With this dual activity, Vilazidone is considered to be a serotonin partial agonist reuptake inhibitor, or SPARI. It may be the overexcitement of neurons of the brain that causes bipolar disorders and that lithium interacts in some complex way with sodium potassium at the cell membrane to stabilize electrical activity. By altering electrical conductivity, lithium represents a potential threat to all body functions, cardiac contraction um, and, sinus, and sinus bradycardia, extreme alteration of cerebral conductivity with overdose can lead to convulsions. An alteration in nerve and muscle conduction can commonly lead, lead to tremor or therapeutic doses or more extreme motor dysfunction with overdose. Hyponatremia can increase the risk of lithium toxicity because increased renal reabsorption of sodium leads to increased reabsorption of lithium. Hypothyroidism in some, which is secondary to interfering with the iodine molecules affecting the formation and conversion to its active form, T3 thyroid hormone. Side effects include polyuria, edema, tremors, bradycardia, and convulsions. Hyponatremia is a high risk for toxicity because increased renal absorption of sodium leads to increased reabsorption of lithium. Dopamine antagonists at the dopamine receptors bind to the receptors and block the attachment of dopamine, dopamine, which reduces dopaminergic transmission. It is thought that overactivity of the dopamine system in certain areas of the brain may be responsible for some of the symptoms of schizophrenia. Blocking dopamine can then reduce the positive symptoms like delusions and hallucinations. Typical antipsychotics block dopamine target positive symptoms of schizophrenia, can increase release of prolactin from the anterior pituitary, which causes amenorrhea, which is an absence of menses, or galacturia, um, which is um, breast mild flow. And in men, it can lead to gynecomastia, which is development of male mammary glands. Atypical antipsychotics block serotonin and dopamine. They target both the negative and positive symptoms of schizophrenia. They're first-line treatment over typical antipsychotics. They do have common side effects, um, but they produce fewer um, extrapyramidal side effects. Metabolic syndrome um, is increased weight gain, blood sugar, and triglycerides can be seen. Clozapine has the potential to suppress bone marrow and induce agranulocytosis because any deficiency in WVCs renders a person prone to serious infection. Regular measurements of WVCs required with this medication. Typically, the count is measured weekly for the first six months, every other week for the next six months, and then monthly thereafter. And Risperdal has the highest risk of EPS among the atypical antipsychotics and may increase prolactin, which may lead to sexual dysfunction. It may also cause orthostatic hypotension. Muscarine blockage affects acetylcholine, which causes dry, dry, dry. Blocking dopamine affects movement. Monitor with the abnormal um, involuntary movement scale or the AIMS. Some of those movements are Parkinsonian, a mask-like face, stiff and stooped posture, shuffling gait, drooling, and tremor. Akinesia is the absence of voluntary motion. Akathisia is regular rhythmic movements, usually of the lower limbs, like restlessness, pacing, tapping the foot insistently, rocking forward and backward in the chair. And tardine dyskinesia is a serious and irreversible side effect. 
It includes involuntary tonic muscle spasms, typically involving the tongue, fingers, toes, neck, trunk, or pelvis. An example is a protruding and rolling tongue, blowing, smacking, licking, rapid purposeless and irregular movements. There's no known treatment. Dopamine acts as the hypothalamic factor that inhibits the release of prolactin from the anterior pituitary gland. Therefore, blockage of dopamine transmission can lead to increased pituitary secretion of prolactin. In women, this hyperprolactinemia can result in amenorrhea or galacturia. In men, it can lead to gynecomastia. Cogentin and Benadryl can treat all of the others and help EPS go away. Thus, it's why so many schizophrenic patients are on these two medications. What you need to do is to remember to teach. The patient should report any muscle stiffness or movement changes, should eat a diet high in roughage, should rise slowly, slowly when getting out of bed, and may experience a dry mouth, and therefore should chew sugarless scum. So this is the end of part two of the concepts of mental health nursing. And make sure that you review the videos that are posted for you on Blackboard because they'll definitely help you understand these processes.